Hi, I'm Steve Fox again. We'll spend the next half hour of video time discussing the rules for determining source of income. If you've not recently done so, you should watch the portion of the introduction lecture on source of income. Click the screen for a link. In that session, we covered the source of interest, dividends, rents, and royalties, which we won't cover again in this session. We will cover exceptions to those. The rules we'll cover are shown here. Please note that some of the regulations have been legislatively repealed. Uh, you should read the law first and keep it handy while you're reading the regulations. Before we proceed, here's a question to ponder. What do Pierre Boulet, Ken Lindsman, Dairy Queen, and Gumby have in common? Just a hint. There are several tax things. Let's find out. First, we'll cover some exceptions to what we discussed earlier. There are several provisions exempting non-residents from U.S. tax on interest on bank deposits. However, the exception doesn't apply if the interest is effectively connected to the conduct of a U.S. trade or business. An example of this is interest on the business bank account. Next, interest paid by a partnership is considered U.S. source by a non-resident payee only to the extent the partnership is engaged in a trader business in the U.S. during the year. There are some limitations on this. Guarantee fees used to be problematic, but Congress fixed the problem in 2010, finally. The source of guarantee fees is the residence of the payor. There's an exception, though. If the guarantor is foreign and the debt and interest paid are effectively connected with a U.S. trade or business, then the source is U.S. Thus, if a foreign parent guarantees debt of a U.S. sub or branch, the source of the fee is U.S. But this provision applies only to guarantees issued after the relevant Section 861A9 was enacted in 2010. The source of interest paid from the federal or a state or local government is U.S. State and local government interest often is tax exempt to everybody. There are special rules for related person factoring income but they only apply to subpart F and the foreign tax credit. For everything else, there are factual issues with the factoring rules. For uh, residents and citizens, when we determine the source of bank deposit interest, we look to the location of the bank branch in most cases, not the banking corporation's place of organization. In the first video, I mentioned an exception to the source rule for dividends. Here's the exception. The source of dividends from a foreign corporation is partly U.S. source, but only for non-residents if the foreign corporation earned more than a fourth of its income in a U.S. trade or business. If it did, then a pro rata part of the dividend is U.S. source and taxable for the non-resident shareholder. Also, where a taxpayer corporation receives a dividend from a foreign corporation and claims the dividends received deduction for that dividend, only part of the dividend is considered foreign source. And now for our first quiz. We talked in the earlier video about the source of services income. The source of services income is where the services are performed. The location of the payor or where the money is paid is irrelevant. Hope you got that question right. There are some additional rules. 
However, there's a $3,000 de minimis exception to the source rule. This isn't an exclusion. It simply changes the source of compensation for some services. It applies only for services rendered in the U.S. by a non-resident for a non-resident. It only applies if the non-resident was in the U.S. less than 90 days during the tax year. Deferred compensation, including pensions and IRA and other uh, distributions, poses some potential problems where the payment is simply deferral of salary or bonus. It's pretty simple. The income is sourced where the services giving rise to that salary or bonus were performed. The same applies to defined benefit or pension plans. This may involve splitting the amount received, as we'll discuss in a moment. For 401k, IRA defined contributions and some other types of plans, though, uh, there's an investment component, and the taxpayer may have made after-tax contributions to those plans. The IRS takes the correct position that return of capital either comes first or is discovered under the annuity rules as appropriate to the type of payment. The question of source of the investment component can be very important for a non-resident. If the investment income in the plan is not U.S. source, then the non-resident pays no tax on that part of the distribution. The IRS takes a position in a revenue ruling that earnings on assets of a U.S. qualified plan are all U.S. source, and earnings on assets in a foreign plan are foreign source. But if the earnings are all portfolio interest, they should be still exempt for a non-resident. There's some untested waters here. So, how much compensation should be attributed to particular services? In New Jersey, do it based on number of days worked where? And for New Jersey, there's a separate rule um, that you allocate the wages first by W-2 and then do the apportionment based on days. That sounds reasonable. Well, Mort, that's just the way the regulations do it. First, try to associate the wages with a job site, then apportion. The regulations do give us a little more flexibility, though. That still leaves us with potential problems for business income. For a CPA or engineering firm, it's often pretty easy since you tend to have time sheets and billing runs so you can track who generated what revenues and where. For a lot of types of services though, we're still stuck trying to figure it out. And that gets us to the question of what is services? How do you tell services from something else? Is building a dam services where the materials that you provide cost more than the labor? There's actually a case on that where the tax court held it was services and sourced it to where the dam was being constructed. That picture that startled me the last time was of the Three Gorges Dam construction. There are a lot of factual issues we have to address. If a performer gets income from recordings of the performance, is that services or is it royalties? Pierre Boulet argued that it was royalties and exempt under the French tax treaty. The tax court said he had no property interest in the recordings, so it was services. The ruling was based on the specific wording and rights under his contract with CBS Records. Lots of factual issues here. What if the payments are for future services? The tax court held that a sign-on bonus for Ken Lenzeman should be allocated based on the number of games played, or to be played, during the period of the contract. 
but the outcome may be different for a payment not to compete. How do you source a payment for not doing something? The Lensman case provides a little guidance, and a 2004 revenue ruling clarifies just a little that there's not much guidance on non-competes out there. And what if the payments are part of the sale of a business or trademark or some other intangible? Fortunately, Congress did something about this. But before they fixed the problem, we had the Moberg brothers and Leisure Dynamics. Both cases still provide some insight on a lot of issues we face in sourcing. The Mobergs owned a Dairy Queen franchise in the 1950s and sold it. Then they retired. By the time the case got to the appeals court, they lived in different circuits. One circuit held one way, ruling that the contingent payment was royalty, and the other held that it was capital gains. And this was on the same transaction. Then along comes Leisure Dynamics, who sold the rights to the Gumby cartoons. Fortunately, Congress enacted the sections shown here and at least partially resolved this dilemma. All this makes a difference because the source of income is affected by how the income is characterized. The source of rents and royalties is where the property is used. That's all well and good, but what if the property moves? For transportation assets, like trucks and railroad cars, it's easier than you might think. The states and Canadian provinces all make you keep track of mileage for highway taxes, and the railroads routinely track use of rolling stock. It's also fairly easy for big mobile assets like drilling rigs or ships. Still, a lot of record keeping can be required. And that brings us back to the question of the day. What do Pierre Boulet, Ken Lenzeman, Dairy Queen, and Gumby have in common? Send me your answers in a one-paragraph email. That is the quiz. There's a special rule that trumps the rules we've discussed so far for income that is attributable to or effectively connected with a trade or business. Such income is treated as sourced to where the trade or business is located. The terms used here are treaty terms that we'll talk about more later. This is sometimes called the force of attraction principle. Under this rule, some income of a non-resident is taxed in the U.S. even if it's foreign source. Also, some income of a resident is treated as foreign source for the foreign tax credit even if it's otherwise U.S. source. The key is whether the income is attributable to a fixed place of business. The definitions are different for different types of income and the details of this rule are quite complex. We're not going to go into the details in this video, and this rule won't be on any test or a quiz in this course. However, you need to be aware of it in practice. This brings us to one of the most important source of income rules for multinational businesses, income from sale of property. We're going to cover the, this in depth with two more quizzes. Here are two links to the law. Each section linked covers only part of the rules. The law has a backwards general rule, which in my experience happens much less than the exceptions. So we'll do the exceptions before the general rule. But first, we need to know what the term sale includes. Sale or other disposition means the taxpayer gave up the rights to the property and doesn't get them back. It doesn't matter much how that occurred. It could have been from a traditional sale 
or from any other transaction in which income is recognized. Since source doesn't matter unless there's recognizable income, the rule thus inherently excludes non-taxable transactions, such as gifts and many types of corporate events. Remember, this rule is solely for purposes of determining source of income. Let's first cover sale of purchased inventory, where a taxpayer buys goods and resells them in the ordinary course of business, the source of the income is where title to those goods passes. What do we mean by title passing? There are two aspects, and it's the overall gestalt of the two that we have to look at. First is bare legal title. Second is economic risk of loss, where they are both transferred at the same time since it's fairly easy to tell where the goods were at the time, that's where title passes. If the title and risk of loss are transferred separately, then we need to look closer at the facts. And current regulation section 1.861-7 controls. It has an anti-abuse rule. Under this regulation, risk of loss is more important but not controlling. Unlike real estate, title to individual goods other than vehicles isn't usually written. We have to look instead to the agreement between the parties as to both title passage and risk of loss passage. This aspect of the agreement is often reflected only on the face of an invoice in the shipping terms. You should all be familiar already with the standard shipping terms under UCC, like FOB factory. But a lot of those terms can be different in the international context. For instance, FOB is used internationally only for the shipment by water of bulk goods like oil or wheat. Tidal passage of a shipment of a container load of something internationally would be hard to determine if it was FOB anything, since the term is undefined for container shipments. Let's uh, look at a key source of definition of shipping terms called INCO terms. The International Chamber of Commerce put out a definition of terms, and about 25 countries, including the US, have agreed to them. Here's a link to the summary on Wikipedia. Please pause the video and read that Wikipedia article. Then do a search of, uh, for I-N-C-O-T-E-R-M-S, all one word. I'll wait a bit while you read what you find. Here's a quick chart. Incoterms defines FOB and XWorks about the same, but for different sorts of shipments. XWorks has the advantage that it works for nearly anything with any point of tidal passage. FOB is strictly shipping by water with tidal passing as the cargo crosses the ship's rail. Notice how the terms specify who is responsible for what and through what point. Title, risk of loss, and responsibility for shipping and for customs duties are all dealt with separately. Another issue I've commonly encountered is that the actions of the parties contradict the terms of the invoice or other terms. For instance, if you always replace defective or damaged goods for your customers at your expense, then shipping terms of X works aren't factually correct. <clears throat> You've assumed the risk of loss not only until delivery, but until acceptance. That can radically change where title passes. That brings us to another quiz.
There's a bit more complex rule for goods the taxpayer or a consolidated return affiliate manufactured. It's often called the 50-50 rule. 50% 50 of the gross income is treated as having a source of where title passed and the other 50% is allocated among the place or places of assets used in making the goods. Then deductions are allocated pro rata. Your readings include two articles by me and John Kennedy on these mixed source rules. The articles are on web campus and the 1996 article is on my website. The 50-50 rule results in strict bifurcation of taxable income. This doesn't mean half one source and half another. Half of it follows the tidal passage rule we discussed before the quiz. That's always a point source. The other half is a bit trickier. It follows the production activity and assets and may itself be mixed source. Usually the production assets are in one place. In such case, all of the production half of the income has a single source. But some of my clients over the years have had multi-stage production. Parts get made in one place and the finished goods made in another. Where the U.S. is one of the places and both are in the same taxpayer or consolidated return group, the gross income must be split between U.S. and non-U.S. based on the tax basis of assets used in the U.S. or outside the U.S. Production assets include only assets that are directly used to produce inventory. Thus, production assets don't include cash, accounts receivable, dis distribution assets, or any warehouse assets. Oddly, a warehouse is treated as a non-production asset for this purpose, even if part of the costs are allocated to cost of goods sold under the 263 Cap A regulations. The regs seem to imply that any indirect production assets are not included. The amount used for production assets is the tax adjusted basis of the assets. As we'll see in the allocation and apportionment part of this course, tracking asset bases is critical in the international area. 863B income is treated as a separate basket in allocating and apportioning deductions. Yes, Morton. So let me see if I got this right. Um, it, for stuff the client buys and sells, it's where title passes under the sales terms. And for stuff they make and sell, it's 50% where title passes and 50% uh, where the production activity happens. And that's based on the tax basis of the assets. Good summary. And we'll talk at length in a later module about allocating and apportioning deductions. Taxpayers get to use an independent factory price instead of the 50-50 rule. That's a permanent election which can be changed only with IRS consent. An independent factory price is a production only price. It's a price that is actually charged to unrelated customers where there is almost zero marketing activity. Under an IFP method, the gross income is allocated as if all goods were sold at the IFP, then purchased and resold by another taxpayer. Thus, this intermediate price establishes how much income is production sourced under the asset rule we just discussed and how much follows title passage under the rule we discussed before. A taxpayer can only use an IFP it can, if it can clearly establish that one exists. To exist, the taxpayer must regularly sell part of its output 
to independent distributors in such a way as to fairly establish an IFP. The IFP only applies to substantially similar inventory sold under substantially similar conditions in substantially similar markets. This substantially similar language is quite similar to that used in the intercompany pricing regulations. The IRS fights many intercompany pricing comparability cases on just these grounds. It's hard to argue that U.S. and foreign markets are substantially similar, so an IFP generally has to be established separately for foreign markets and for U.S. markets. Shipping terms other than X-Works Factory can often defeat an IFP since they require the producing taxpayer to do something other than just produce. Like, how do you establish this weird independent factory price? Do you sell part of your output to some particular customer for some odd amount? I don't think you can fairly establish an IFP with only a small portion of your sales. There's an intercompany pricing case that said a shipping company didn't establish a comparable uncontrolled price uh, with 7% of its shipping when the rest of its shipping was for an, a related party. We've now covered sale of inventory. There are some rules for other types of property and fortunately they're mostly pretty easy. Taxpayers may sell depreciable personal property that's subject to the recapture rules. In such case, the recapture portion of gain is sourced to where the depreciation deductions were allocated. Generally, depreciable or depletable assets don't generate mixed source income, so this can be fairly easy. Even factory assets generate only one source since they are production assets under the 50-50 rule and the income follows the asset. But if you have an asset that can be moved, you may need to track how the depreciation deductions were allocated over the years. Gain on sale of stock of a foreign affiliate, like a foreign sub, uh, with 50% or more of its gross income from an active foreign business is sourced foreign, but only if the sale occurs in that same foreign country. As we discussed earlier, gain on sale of an intangible is considered royalty to the extent the payments are contingent on use or sale. Gain on the sale of goodwill is sourced to where the goodwill was generated. The rest of any intangibles gain is sourced under the default rule. And this gets us to the so-called general rule, which is really just a default rule. Gain on other stuff is sourced to the residence of the seller. For this purpose, and only this purpose, a citizen or resident alien is considered resident outside the U.S. only if he or she pays foreign tax of 10% or more on the gain. Determining the source of income from property transactions of a partnership is done at the partner level to the extent that's relevant. The source of some income from property sales follows residence of the partner. Therefore, it's possible to have an item of income of a partnership sourced differently for different partners. There's yet another exception to the default rule. Gain of a resident of the U.S. that would be sourced under the default rule, that is, U.S., is sourced foreign if it's effectively connected with the an office or fixed place of business outside the U.S. Gain of a non-resident 
whether another exception applies or not, is sourced U.S. if it's effectively connected with an office or fixed place of business in the U.S. Thus, if Pierre, a resident of Togo, has an art gallery in Manhattan and he sells a case of wine that he's been saving for years to a gallery customer from New Jersey, the capital gain is U.S. source and taxable. But this exception has an exception for inventory to be used by the customer outside the U.S. Losses are a different story. There are special rules in regulations under Section 865. They're tough. Uh, you should read these regulations at some point in your career as you need them. We won't cover them in this course. So with that, let's do another quiz. There's one more piece of the sourcing puzzle. The regulations tell us how to determine the nature of income related to computer software, sourcing of which otherwise would be very tricky. Software income is treated as one of three things. It's services if the income is from substantial custom modification of any computer programs. It's treated as a sale of an article if the software is sold or licensed without giving the customer rights to reproduce the software. They can make limited copies for their own use, but that's it. This is how most consumer software is sold. Finally, the income is treated as income from licensing or royalties if the license or sale grants the customer the right to reproduce the software. This regulation does not determine the source. It merely determines the nature of the income. So let's summarize what we've covered. Interest and dividends are sourced to the residents of the payor. Rents and royalties are sourced to where the property is used. The source of gross income on inventory purchased and resold is where title passes on sale. The source of gross income on inventory produced by the taxpayer is 50% where title passes and 50% allocated where production assets are located. However, a taxpayer may permanently elect to use an independent factory price if one exists. The source of depreciation recapture follows the allocation of prior depreciation deductions. Stock gains on active foreign subsidiaries are potentially foreign source. And most other gains are sourced to the residence of the taxpayer. That wraps up our coverage of the source of income rules. In a later session, We'll cover the rules on allocating and apportioning deductions. I hope this was helpful, and thanks for learning with me.